Hi, I'm Rachel, here with Leia, who's snuggled up in bed behind me. And uh, lately, my list of anticipated reads of uh, 2018 and uh, speculative sci-fi and fantasy fiction has been growing. So I thought that rather than wait until December for some sort of uh, big anticipated reads announcement, I take advantage of the fact that uh, well, first of all, I have seven titles to talk about, and secondly, well, next week is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, so why not make a video now? <laughs> Most of these books are sequels. Most of them are fantasy. And most of them are YA. And I think that's just the way things uh, crumble within the uh, front list category. I actually have a lot of... Uh, adult science fiction backlist on my TBR, but <laughs> not to talk about here. So I thought I'd start with uh, my two adult fiction picks and tell you when they're coming out and a little bit about them. So coming out on April 10th is Fire Dance by Ilana C. Meyer, which is the follow-up to her novel The Last Song Before Night. I really love this looping uh, calligraphy and uh, the uh, sort of steampunk looking design of the cover, it almost looks more sci-fi to me, but uh, <laughs> it draws me in. <laughs> I reviewed the last song before night last year as part of my 2016 Jewish speculative fix video. <laughs> I'll link that down below. And this was my favorite of those three books that I reviewed. Um, I was also thrilled to learn that Thomas from SFF 180 heard about this book and reviewed it, because, you know, in the speculative fiction world, uh, Thomas is uh, basically Coruscant, and uh, I am way out on Tatooine. <laughs> and the big reason I was drawn to the book is I first heard about it on the Jewish Book Council website when uh, she wrote a few blog posts to promote it. So admittedly, I wanted to read about the book because Meyer grew up Orthodox, and uh, one of her characters in particular has sort of a sheltered Orthodox female upbringing, and uh, her main city of Tamberlin is based on Jerusalem, and she writes about this in the Jewish Book Council. I'll link to Thomas's full review below, but I know his main gist was that he loved her descriptive writing, especially of Tamberlin, and was intrigued to see where she was going to go next, so uh, <laughs> Thomas, in case you haven't heard of it, speculative fiction uh, upcoming release that I've heard of, April 10th. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, after the lovely descriptions, he was sort of meh on the fact that the, uh, the story devolved into your usual questing narrative, and you could almost hear the Lord of the Rings music behind it. <laughs> and I think with a little bit of distance from the book, I, I kind of agree with that. When I was first reading the book, I really uh, fell in love with the characters so much, and... Uh, a lot of that I do think has to do with the fact that I've read the Jewish Book Council uh, article, so it's not entirely fair, because you don't usually have the author whispering in your ear about her inspirations. <laughs> but I still do love the characters, and I'm interested to see where they go next, because I believe Fire Dance actually takes place in a different location. We're moving away from fantastical Jerusalem. <laughs> and I particularly like the focus on uh, troubadours because that was another one of her big inspirations that you really don't need an article to tell you that once you start reading it. The main character is like a very rare female troubadour and it's one of those things where you know so much fantasy is military and uh, I really like fantasy where the world building and culture and any magical aspects perhaps have to do with the arts so very excited. Hoping that we're going on and up from here. Then on June 14th, we have uh, this adult sci-fi release that I'm looking forward to, and probably almost everyone is looking forward to. <laughs> Certainly uh, sci-fi people, but also a lot of uh, my fellow literary people have uh, fallen in love with this series. I'm talking of uh, Record of a Spaceborn Few by Becky Chambers, the third novel in her uh, series that began with The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. We don't have, I think, the official uh, cover yet, but I believe that's the uh, font for it. And again, everyone and their mother on BookTube has reviewed this, but I think I'll link to uh, the review that actually uh, introduced me to the first book, and the way that uh, Elizabeth in the review uh, gushed about it really got my juices going. I'm like, whoa, this sounds so fascinating. It really, to me, sounded like my favorite TV shows in book form, 
and after I read the first two books, I just knew that I wanted this to be my bookish sci-fi series, you know, that I could fall in love with. I mean, I really loved the first book and the adventures on the spaceship and how the crew was family. And I really loved the second book, too. I didn't think I would or I was concerned because I, in the first book, I didn't really feel anything for those characters. And I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to, like, live on a space station planet or whatever. I don't know if that would interest me or these characters would, but I really loved them. I, I grew to love their backstories and their world building and their relationships it was it was just wonderful and so here's what to expect in the third book hundreds of years ago the last humans left earth aboard the exodus fleet after centuries spent wandering empty space humanity was welcomed mostly by the well-established species that governed the milky way their generational journey came to an end but this is old history Today, the Exodus fleet is a living relic, a place where many are from, but outsiders have seldom seen. Exodans take a great pride in their community and traditions, but the cultures from beyond their bulkheads have profoundly influenced their own. Those who have not yet left for alien cities and terrestrial colonies are left grappling with questions. What is the purpose of a ship that has reached its destination? Why remain among the stars when there are habitable worlds within reach? How can they maintain their carefully balanced way of life, and is it worth saving at all? Record of a spaceborne few unravels this complicated reality through a cast of new voices, a young apprentice unsure of his future, a lifelong spacer who wonders if her children might be better suited for the ground, a planet-raised traveler, an alien academic, a caretaker for the dead, and of course the archivist who ensures that no one's story is forgotten. Set in the sprawling universe of the Galactic Commons, this third standalone installment of the Wayfarers series travels to another corner of the cosmos, one often mentioned, but not yet explored. Doesn't that just sound great? It sounds a lot like a callback to the first book, because we'll be on a ship with a wide diversity of characters and uh, exploring um, their cultural <laughs> issues about uh, who they are and who they want to be an identity and uh, oh gosh i just uh, i don't know <laughs> i don't think i need to sell this i think most of you love this and i love it too and i'm so looking forward to this <laughs> and now we will move on to my five picks in ya fiction this first one comes out on january 9th and it's not a sequel it's an absolute it's a new debut novel it's called beneath the haunting sea by joanna ruth meyer I sort of knew Joanna several years ago through a NaNoWriMo Vidler community where we posted uh, videos throughout November about our writing experiences. And I think for a little while our paths intersected and we left comments on each other's videos, but I'm not sure if she remembers me. <laughs> but she left a bit of an impact on me because uh, I could tell from the off and from her blog how dedicated she was to the art of writing her YA fantasies and uh, how she really made this career, her career that she put so much time and effort into trying to achieve her goal of getting her work published, which she finally is about to do. And I'm pretty sure I've heard her talk about this uh, particular book when it was a very different, rougher draft. So I almost feel like I kind of know it. I mean, I didn't know much about it. I think I only knew broad strokes, but uh, here is the official, or one of the official summaries of uh, what is now called Beneath the Haunting Sea. And also, don't you just love this calligraphy? I'll be honest, I'm not sure how much I like the picture, but I really love the, the swirling writing. <laughs> Sixteen-year-old Talia was born to a life of certainty and luxury, destined to become empress of half the world. But when an ambitious rival seizes power, she and her mother are banished to a nowhere province on the far edge of the Northern Sea. It is here, in the drafty halls of the Ruin Dar, that Talia discovers family secrets, a melancholy boy with a troubling vision of her future, and a relic that holds the power of an ancient star. On these shores, an eerie melody of the sea is stronger than ever, revealing long-forgotten tales of the goddess Rahn. The more dark truths that Talia unravels about the god's history and her own, the more the waves call to her, and it may be her destiny to answer. 
again, I think this comes down to my interest in uh, the non-military, like there seems to be a lot of uh, mythology in uh, this description, and also uh, because I kind of know this author from at least her public profiles. <laughs> I know that she uh, is a piano player and a piano teacher, so she has a musical background, and I'm really intrigued to see how that might play into her world building. So yeah, people interested in debut YA fantasy? Uh, coming out early next year. Then on March 13th, we have the third installment of a popular YA uh, science fiction series, uh, Obsidio, which is part of the Illuminae Files. This series is just cracked to me. It's just so much fun. You know, the, uh, the general story is pretty one-dimensional. It's just kick-ass teenagers, you know, fighting off the, the man, <laughs> as it were, in space. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just being your stereotypical badasses who fall in love. But uh, I listened to it on audiobook, and it's like tuning into an old radio show, I think, except probably with much better production. <laughs> and uh, there's just a full cast of uh, characters and so many great sound effects and uh, it's just so much fun. I've just loved listening to the last two and uh, I would really suggest to anybody who just uh, wants a really fun silly romp to uh, listen to the audiobooks of the Illuminate books and, and, <laughs> and a third one will be coming out soon. I certainly hope my library uh, gets it within uh, some decent amount of time. <laughs> Here's to hoping. I've lost my companion, but returning again to the date of April 10th, we have the third installment of another popular YA series, this time in fantasy. This is The Reaper at the Gates by Saba Tahir, the third in her An Ember in the Ashes series. You can see that she has recently changed the cover design for all of her books, and this one is the uh, next installment. And uh, I appreciate why she wanted to do this and to feature her characters, particularly because they're a diverse cast. I'm all about inclusion and a reminder that uh, this is a d diverse world. <clears throat> but I kind of do miss the old ones. I liked uh, the uh, stone designs and uh, blocky lettering and, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's really what's inside that counts. and. Uh, and I'm not always actually the most uh, visual of uh, imaginers anyway when it comes to imagining characters, so it is kind of nice to put a face to a name, as it were. <laughs> but anyway, far more interesting than what's on the cover is what's under it, and so I'll read a little bit about what to expect from number three. Beyond the Empire and within it, the threat of war looms even larger. The blood shrike, Helene Aquila, is assailed on all sides. Emperor Marcus, haunted by his past, grows increasingly unstable, while the Commandant, capitalizes on his madness to bolster her own power. As Helene searches for a way to hold back the approaching darkness, her sister's life and the lives of those in the Empire hang in the balance. Far to the east, Laia of Sarah knows the fate of the world lies not in the machinations of the martial court, but in stopping the Nightbringer. But while hunting for a way to bring him down, Laia faces unexpected threats from those she hoped would aid her, and is drawn into a battle she never thought she'd have to fight. And in the land between the living and the dead, Elias Venturius has given up his freedom to serve as soul catcher. But in doing so, he has vowed himself to an ancient power that will stop at nothing to ensure Elias' devotion, even at the cost of his humanity. I feel like uh, I can get away with saying this, but this feels like something in the vein of a YA Game of Thrones to me. And I appreciated this from the beginning, how, the, how Saba Tahir built up this really brutal world, and then had her characters have to deal with it. Like, uh, the augurs would make these horrible predictions, and instead of uh, us having a loop around for the characters, they would suffer horrible things and have to learn how to live with it. And uh, I just uh, was really fascinated by that. And I'm fascinated, of course, by uh, the political machinations. I really like the villains, because they don't seem one-dimensional to me. They're horrible people but they have backstories, they have motivations for what they do. And uh, I really grew last year to love Helene. I really just love uh, the uh, horrible position that she finds herself in. I believe she is actually the torch against the night, if I remember correctly from what the augurs told her in the last book. <laughs> and I'm excited by the fact that uh, Elias and Laia are um, starting to get more involved in uh, the fantastical elements, which uh, 
to here has slowly been um, introducing into the story, which also feels a bit like Game of Thrones, and so too is the whole fact that, you know, maybe all of this uh, political infighting is, isn't, isn't as important as something supernatural. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds in this world. And uh, I think there's three potentially pretty strong plot points in this uh, plot narratives going forward. So I'm just really excited. I uh, can't wait. <laughs> Next, I'm including a book that uh, doesn't have a name or a release date yet, although my good trusty friend Goodreads tells me that uh, it is due to be out in 2018. And it is the second installment of the Sword and Verse series, which is a YA fantasy series by Kathy McMillan. So I know Kathy McMillan indirectly because a friend of mine was a beta reader for her in this novel. So, um... And actually, Kathy lives near to me, so I got to take a little bit of a part in her uh, press uh, for the first book. And uh, since there isn't a uh, cover yet for the second book, I will just hold up the cover of the first book. And I assume that the second book will look something like this. So the premise of this book is that uh, we are in another epic fantasy land where there is an enslaved group of people who were once scribes, kind of similar to Laia's people in the Ember and the Ashes series. But I actually think that Macmillan does a better job of um, building up the backstory of this scribing, particularly because she made three actual languages that uh, crop up a bit in the first book. And uh, she signed books in that language. I'll, let you, I'll show you that. See how pretty. <laughs> Looks a little like geometry to me, but I guess so does everything that I can't really read. <laughs> so this uh, book actually... Uh, deals with a whole issue of a revolt that happens and uh, seems to have a have a bit of an ending. But what I appreciate about uh, the sequel is that uh, it will go into the aftermath of having to deal with what happened and it will be told from the point of view of another character so we get a new perspective. So uh, that'll be kind of interesting to me. And this uh, character I think is a little snarky because I know my friend, the beta reader, really liked her and <laughs> she likes snarky people. And we only get to see her a little bit in this book, so it'll be interesting to see more of her coming up whenever she comes to us, hopefully in 2018. And finally, I did these out of order because this one is so exciting to me <laughs> and to everybody, I believe, who was a teenager in the 90s and uh, reading the books from Tortell. <laughs> if any of you are watching, I think you know what I'm talking about by now. <laughs> She's been promising this for years and uh, it's finally coming. Look at this cover. Look at the beautiful bold colors and the bold type. <laughs> It's Tempests and Slaughter, the first in a new series by Tamara Pierce. <laughs> I know a lot of people uh, fell in love with the Alana the Warrioress uh, series that she did, but um, as I've stated numerous times now, <laughs> I don't like military as much. And I really fell in love with uh, Dane, who was the uh, protagonist of the Immortal series. And I actually read the third book, Emperor Mage, first. I don't know, I guess uh, somebody gave it to me first. <laughs> who knows? And that's the book where the backstory that became this book came in. <laughs> and so I was really intrigued because uh, I think I really liked the political machinations of it again. <laughs> so I'll read a bit to refresh your memories or to introduce new people. <laughs> Aram Draper is a boy on the path to becoming one of the realm's most powerful mages. The youngest student in his class at the Imperial University of Karthak. He has a gift with an unlimited power for greatness. That's a gift with a uh, capital G. It means that he has magical ability. <laughs> anyway, his gift has potential for greatness, but also potential for attracting danger. At his side are his two best friends, Varese, a clever girl with an often overlooked talent, and Orzon, a leftover prince with, a sec with secret ambitions. Together, these three friends forge a bond that will one day shape kingdoms. And as Orzorn gets closer to the throne and Varese gets closer to Aram's heart, Aram begins to realize that one day soon he will have to decide where his loyalties truly lie. In the Numer Chronicles, readers will be rewarded with the never-before-told story of how Numer Salmalin came to Tortal. Newcomers will discover an unforgettable fantasy adventure where a kingdom's future rests on the shoulders of a talented young man with a knack for making vicious em enemies. <laughs> And uh, if, you've re if you've read Emperor Mage, you know how this ends in a few decades' time. <laughs> so I would suggest uh, everybody pick up or refresh themselves on the Immortal series. 
as well as perhaps the Alana the, the Night series and all of the other books that I admittedly haven't read, the, the books that she's written in concurrent uh, years after the 90s <laughs> that go forward into the future. <laughs> I haven't read them, I admit, but I still have such a special place in my heart for the Immortals series, so I really want to read this one because it ties into that a bit. And I know a lot of other people who uh, loved YA fantasy in the 90s along with me uh, might be wanting to read this too, so... So, February 6th! It's coming! It's finally coming! So that about covers it for me now. You can find links to the Goodreads pages for all of these upcoming books down below. I might be mentioning them again in later videos, who knows, but I'm also glad to have cleared the floor a bit because I'm sure I'll want to gush about uh, more books, speculative and uh, non-speculative alike, in upcoming months as the 2018 list of uh, expected books continues to come to us. <laughs> Man, there's just so much to read. <laughs> Maybe I should get back to that. <laughs> so thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.